Hello everyone, just wanted to invite you guys back into the conversation. Um, as we are going live right now, I'm going to go ahead and ask both Sam and I to share this live broadcast as we're going on so that we could invite others to the conversation. Uh, so I invite you to do the same if you can. Um, so bear with us as we do that and then we'll go into the conversation. Um, definitely want to see uh, about some conversations, topics that we've been thinking about uh, as we kind of just wrestle with some ideas, wrestle with some topics that we've been thinking about, whether it's personally or as a team here at Visioneering. Um, would love to hear what you guys are thinking about as well as we move forward. So um, let me know your thoughts. So one of the ideas that we uh, are talking about is comes from uh, this uh, quote that Winston Churchill, um, I, I quote it quite a bit. So people that know me uh, will know that I quote this very heavily because it very much goes in line with the work that we do at Visioneering, but this is not even about Visioneering really, it's, just, it's about our own journeys mm -hmm. as artists and as creatives, as visionaries, as leaders. So the quote is this, uh, Winston Churchill, he uh, made this quote that said, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. So it really made me think about the implications of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the things that we shape, the things that we create, the things that we envision uh, actually become tools uh, that then shape us because there's ups and downs of our own journeys and we'd still love to just maybe unpack that, maybe wrestle a bit, yeah. agree, disagree. Um, so I'd ask you, Sam, what are some of the things that come to mind when you consider that quote, whether in the context mm -hmm. of architecture, design, personal uh, vision, things like that, what are some things that come to mind? I think for me, everything that I've created has transformed me. So the creative process is a transformer of the process personally. Um, and so, you know, most of the times when I'm creating something for the world and feeling like I'm gonna create something for the world because I think the world needs it, it actually reflects upon my own need. And, and by creating it, it kind of resolves that need. And so, it's just kind of like, I don't know, it's a catch-22 or the circular kind of right. thing where, you know, the greatest transformations of my life happen through you know, the creative projects that I've done, like, you know, the Story of Yellow project or the 365 Moments project, um, something that started off as just a, a act of creation, uh, actually ended up transforming me to be the person that I am today. It even changed the way I think, changed the way I see. Yeah. And so, you know, this quote definitely is, rings very true to me. Um, but at the same time, the, the you know, the other side of that is, you know, the space that I'm in, does that shape, does it go in reverse as well? Sure. Well, I think, actually, you mentioned 365 moments. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you okay with maybe sharing a little bit about yeah. how that came about and how that journey was for you, the mm -hmm. first cycle, mm -hmm. and even what the second cycle means for you? Totally. Because I, I do like the idea that it is a circular relationship. It's almost, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's an Eastern thought versus a Western mm -hmm. thought. So it's not linear, mm -hmm. right? It's not like you have a beginning and then an end. Mm -hmm. That it's really about we shape things, they shape yeah. us. We shape things, they shape us. Mm -hmm. It is a circular yeah. thing. So can but, you? But but just to kind of add to that, that it, but it is a it is a forward progress, right? So it's more like rolling sure. versus yeah. you know that's gr that's spinning in a on a mouse wheel. Yeah, it's actually this idea that like as you build this kind of momentum in, in that cyclical cycle right. that we're actually still moving forward right. and That's becoming a, you know, a better version of ourselves with each cycle. Um, but yeah, I mean, the 365 Moments Project happened in 2015 where, you know, a lot of my life and a lot of our, you know, in the, you know, the, the Instagram world or in the, in the faith-based world, we talk about, you know, what it means to be present and everyone just, you know, puts out these cute little Instagram posts that says, you know, be present in the moment, or, you know, life is measured by the, you know, moments I take your life, you know, those type of like cute things. And so I've seen myself also kind of perpetuating that narrative 
but I didn't create a system in my life to be present. And so 365 moments was actually an attempt, a project in my own life for me to be present. And so the idea is I take a, a picture a day uh, of a moment worth remembering, right? Um, and so literally in the beginning I used my big camera and, and I had took beautiful photography of my children. And every day I would be looking and seeking or even creating that moment in order to have that moment. And, and in 2015 when I did it, I actually did it 365 days. It was one of the most transformative projects because it taught me to be fully present in the moment. Uh, even though I was taking a picture, I knew that I was, again, in that moment, capturing it. And what that did was it actually slowed down time for me. Because when I think of 2015 and I reflect back on it, it actually feels very long. And even when I go and look at the pictures, I could actually like fully remember. It acts like a trigger of that moment. In 2016, uh, it was a different season where it was the exact opposite. Is where I ended up stepping into uh, the entrepreneurial world of starting businesses, running businesses. And I tried to do it, but it just didn't work out. And what ended up happening was 2016 flew by, and as I reflect back on 2016, I didn't have those moments. And so I'm doing it again in 27 to kind of re-engage that habit. And this creative project, you know, the things that we created is, is continuing to shape me to become more present in the here and now. And so even in 2017, it's night and day versus 2016, uh, simply because I'm being intentional about taking a picture a day um, or capturing that moment uh, that is worth remembering. And if I don't have it, like last night, you know, I didn't have a moment. And so that's what compelled me to go to the gym to have my moment. Mm -hmm. And I went to the gym for the first time in 2017 and captured that picture. And it, it actually spurred me on towards physical health. Mm -hmm. And I think what's gonna help me to do is continue to move in that way. So, so in that way, it shaped me tremendously. So if you look at, if you look at Sam's uh, Instagram feed at I am Samsung, you'll see that he captures daily moments um, and he's off, you know, very honest as well when, you know, if there's a day <laughs> that he yeah. has in fact skipped, um, and I'm sure that's somewhat painful in some ways, but the, the transformation that you've seen overall. It's interesting though that, that you would say that, that if you look back at 2015 when you first did it, that it seems like a, a, an extra oh, yeah. long year and that because you slowed down, you were fully present. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna go back to even the context of the quote where it says that our build, we shape our buildings thereafter they shape us and actually take it back even to say the physical or built environment, whether it's architecture, um, urban design or things like that. Mm -hmm. Basically the physical environment and what that does, mm -hmm. uh, if we are present, mm -hmm you know, mentally, physically yeah. in that space to really understand sort of the, the design intentionality of those mm -hmm. spaces. You know, we think of it even at our work, we talk about that uh, there is always a story, mm -hmm. a story to uh, the sequence of spaces that were, or the environment, that there is this alignment between story and space that really gives it the synergy that people want to be a part of. Mm -hmm. and. And so in a sense, the culture of the organization or of the company uh, that is made manifest in the physical environment so that the culture of the organization, whether it be innovation, whether it be collaboration, whether it be integrity, transparency, there are ways from a design perspective that you can reflect that, such as if you have a, a corporation that has headquarters and some of their values are uh, collaboration or even diversity. We were talking earlier about this idea that even types of spaces in your office, there has to be a, a diversity to those spaces. So we thought of the idea of spatial diversity as a way to have different types of spaces that would facilitate different type of activities, even if it means one person alone yeah. on the phone, you know, like a, a telephone uh, closet almost or a booth, and then there might be a space where you have, uh, it does facilitate collaboration. But what happens is when a corporation or organization doesn't have the types of spaces that facilitate mm -hmm. the values of that organization, mm -hmm. it, it, the building then becomes almost an obstacle yeah. 
to the organization actually living out mm -hmm. those values. The reverse can also be true where the space in a sense does offer spatial diversity, it does allow for different types of activities, but that the organization itself doesn't actually have those values mm -hmm. present in their behaviors and mindsets. So sometimes visionary leaders will say, well, I want to, in a sense, chart a path for these values to be facilitated by the spaces. So I will create those spaces, which bring up those opportunities, and then through leadership, we will help to facilitate that type of mindset and behaviors. Mm -hmm. So the idea that the physical environment can also facilitate behaviors or mindsets. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether it's, in, in this case, we're talking about buildings mm -hmm. or spaces as a way to uh, facilitate some type of cultural architecture. But, um, so any thoughts that come to mind? I mean, you know, while you're talking, you know, I think there's been pendulum swings, right? So, you know, 10 years ago, everyone was in cubicles. And then maybe even 20 years ago, everyone was in this cubicle kind of nation type of thing. And then all of a sudden, it swung way to the other side where everything became right. open, right? right? And I've been in environments where it was so open that we always had to go either into a, literally a closet to have right. a private phone call or we would have to step outside. And so I think diversity, the spatial diversity is actually a beautiful thing, not only in space, but just in general, right? right? That diversity really enables um, the richness of the space, right? Um, and then also kind of like you know, going to the original point, uh, the original thing that you were mentioning is that you know, when I talk about presence, I think you know, I always use two words. It's the here and now. So it's not just a time-based thing, mm -hmm. but it's a physical mm -hmm. thing, right? So you know, to be present you know, virtually is, it doesn't, feel as, it doesn't feel as real as if it's like us right here talking and being present in this moment. So just want to kind of just... Yeah, add that caveat to the idea of presence because I think the physicality of things is also very important. There, there is a conversation I had even with uh, someone uh, earlier today that many times leaders do see the value and connection between environment mm -hmm. and culture, um, and they many times believe, like we were saying earlier, as an example, they believe that the the stumbling blocks to their culture. Uh, being facilitated is because of their environment, that their environment doesn't allow for it. It's funny though that when we've come to some organizations and we've done a deep dive into their organization mm -hmm. and start to ask the leaders about vision, mission, and values, and then ask the, uh, the team members or employees or their other leadership about, in a sense, what is their culture, uh, you begin to realize in many cases that the stumbling block is not their environment mm -hmm. or not their mm -hmm. building, but in fact, it's really a leadership issue. Mm -hmm. It's a cultural issue mm -hmm. that you can't solve a cultural issue with building or spaces. Yeah. You have to resolve that from a leadership perspective first because the spaces, the environments are only a tool it's not the answer, it's a tool to arrive at the cultural answer. So uh, I know we talked about that earlier, but um, any, any thoughts about that, about things being a leadership issue and not necessarily a, yeah. an environment issue? I, I do agree that, that sometimes you know, we feel like we find that silver bullet or that perfect design or, or uh, that perfect software that's gonna solve all of the organizational problems. Usually that doesn't exist. Um, you, like you said, it, it is a tool. And what ends up happening is sometimes we like to um, kind of mask the real problem with the surface, surface uh, problem of needing tools, right? Or needing the space. And what ends up happening is as you start digging a little deeper, you actually, you're right. It's, you know, you could create the most beautiful space, but if you don't have someone serving, guiding, and actually telling the story of the space, um, there's a lot to be missed. You know, uh, there's nothing like you mentioned yesterday that you go to a museum and do a self-guided tour, right. and you could kind of gain kind of the idea, the big idea of the curated art piece. But having a docent, as you were mentioning earlier, helps reveal and even kind of take it to even a deeper and more meaningful, more memorable experience when there's someone 
guiding people and leading people through the experience. And so, you know, space without leadership is really just a space. Mm -hmm. But space with some sort of a leadership or even a storyteller or a guide to kind of help facilitate the narrative, I think, is uh, is probably the more effective way to bring about the behavioral change that most organizations are looking for. They're not looking for tools and, and, and bells and whistles. I think most organizations, the issue always lies towards uh, motivation and behavior, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and how do you get people to be self-directed and, right. and, and feel impassioned and feel aligned with, you know, the vision and mission of, of the whole. Um, well, part of what Sam is referencing is this, the idea that we could take lessons learned in other disciplines, yeah. you know, in, in, in sort of uh, web development uh, or technology development, there is this idea of user experience, UX, or user interface, UI. Um, and that is the idea that you want to be able to curate that user's entire experience from the moment they click on, log on, or land on your website that you, every single click, every single navigation is a curated experience and that they can easily find their way through the mm-hmm. app or through the website and that that whole experience is on point, that it's it's a, a unified and a consistent message or storyline throughout. And so we've adopted some of those UX principles to even the idea of of, uh, of guest experience, whether, you know, guest experience when you go to Disneyland, literally from the parking structure to the castle, that whole experience is a curated experience, that even the, the staff members are considered cast members because they're part of that story. The trash cans, the gates, everything is in unison with that greater story. So when we work with, like, say, a church or a nonprofit, uh, we want the spaces to absolutely reflect the cultural narrative of the organization, their values, their mission, and their vision in such a way that if you were to have a staff member or even a volunteer be fully uh, in connection with the values of that organization and that the design of the space or the environment is, is created in a way that it is literally you could like if someone was a tour guide or a docent of that space like one would be at a museum that the sequencing of spaces the sequencing of how a guest would experience those spaces is part of this long narrative that maybe an art piece in the lobby maybe a environmental graphic on the wall maybe even the text on the floor or the way spaces are adjacent to each other all these different things relate to something that is relevant to their culture and that tour guide or that docent can point those out as they're going through the space and have it be in a sense a way to tell a spatial story Mm -hmm. it's a spatial story but it's in reflection of a cultural story Uh, so it's this idea from ux ui that we've adopted and you know there's a ton of uh, conversation these days about experience but uh, I'm going to reel it back a little bit because mm-hmm. I think I've been talking a lot about the spatial aspect mm-hmm. of it, but you know the whole idea of us shaping things thereafter they shape us, I have been really fascinated with the idea that leaders, even visionaries, they do have a vision and they want to take the people that they lead on this journey and they have an idea of what that looks like, of how it will take place for them to get there and they have a very strong idea of how long it will take for them to get there many times probably more times than not it doesn't happen that way it doesn't happen that way so they actually there is in a sense if you were to map out that journey the highs and lows of that journey they are learning about themselves the good and the bad they're, they're, they're being course corrected throughout the process and they're growing. They're growing in self-awareness. They're growing in awareness about the people that they lead because, you know, I've heard it said that adversity doesn't change you. It reveals you. Um, and it, so it reveals faults, but it also can reveal significance, which is something that we talk about a lot. Uh, any thoughts about that? I, you, you were about to <laughs> jump in right well, there. Well, I don't think that leaders actually know what the vision is and okay. know how to get there and how okay. long it's going to get there. I don't think that's what makes a leader a leader. I think a leader is someone that just knows how to start 
and ask someone to trust them and follow them and learn how to figure this out together and learn how to course correct on the way. So do you, are you, when, you, when, you, when I say vision of knowing what it looks like, do you believe in that context that vision is about a destination? Or do you think, I know you don't think oh, yeah. that. Uh -huh. I know you don't uh -huh. think that. Yeah. So I don't want to, re it represented that that's what I'm yeah, saying yeah, yeah, because yeah. I'm yeah. not. I actually think that vision is about a direction. Mm -hmm. That it is in a sense a direction that we're picking. We may not know what the end looks like, but I'm choosing to take this direction. I know, you know, a lot of my sort of vision, um, uh, the people that I look up to that talk a lot about vision and even visioneering, talk about a preferred future. Mm -hmm. I don't think a preferred future, even though he describes it, Andy Stanley, <laughs> as a destination, uh -huh. um, that's where I would push back a little bit is, I don't think it's a destination, I think it's a direction. Mm -hmm. And you know, you could point west and not know what, what is necessarily mm -hmm. at the destination when you do walk west. Mm -hmm. I'm rambling a bit, but so unpack that a little bit more from your perspective even if you disagree. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I, just, I just always think about this, this idea of step of faith. Mm -hmm. right? So it's one step of faith. And so a vision is more of, for, you know, I always say, you know, you know, vision is about not the where, not the why, which I know Simon Sinek fans mm -hmm. will love, but mm -hmm. it's about the who. Right. You know, who is the vision, right? So for us who are you know, led by faith, you know, be thou art my vision, that is a very important song for me. And it's more of the vision is who I'm doing this with. And usually for me, what I've discovered is like, I have a very foggy idea of where this, what I call the, my, my future, what I'm going after in my life is what I call the beautiful future. And a lot of people make fun of me because it is so vague. And the reason why I keep it so vague is I have no idea what the beautiful future looks like, but my, I am directed towards that. I'm directed towards beauty. I'm directed towards um, mystery. I'm directed towards that route. And the people that I lead know that about me, that I am not going to define the beautiful future for them, but I know that there is that promise at the end. And I'm asking people to take the step of faith, one step with me, as I <laughs> as I journey along in this in this um, journey, as you want to call it, or as we call it, um, to that destination of the beautiful future. You know what I mean? But I'm not worried about what that actually is. I'm actually worried about who I'm with mm -hmm. and who's leading me through it. I'd love to get people to weigh in here. You know, give give us your thoughts about this idea of you know foggy vision versus let's say vision clarity you know that that's probably going to get us into a little bit of trouble here uh, but but it is yeah i wonder yeah. i do wonder though if if there is something to that that a foggy vision as a direction versus a clear vision as a destination mm -hmm. is is if there is one is that a reflection of the type of leader mm -hmm. that says like you I prefer a foggy vision because I am more concerned about pointing a direction, recruiting people to come along so that they can discover the vision for their particular mm -hmm. lives. And when we as a group of people find our own personal clarity or true narrative for ourselves, mm -hmm. but because we're, we're traveling together based on this foggy mm -hmm. vision, then it's about discovering uh, 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 some clarity for us as person as, as individuals versus mm -hmm. the idea if if a leader is more prone to give a very clear mm -hmm. distinct very crystallized vision it's could it be that that is more about his vision and he's recruiting people to support him exactly. is that kind of what you're That's talking absolutely about absolutely it is that you don't allow people to like what i'm doing is i'm calling people forth to something that is uncertain and is mysterious because you could plan all you want up to the start, but if you're not prepared for the journey, you're not gonna finish the journey. And so for me, preparation is, is understanding how to have crucial conversations, how to walk in uncertainty, how to walk in ambiguity, because for me, I don't want people to fulfill my vision. 
I want for us to fulfill the vision that is called upon us, right? And so I might say, I see things clearly this way, let's go this way. And, you know, in a sense, I keep things vague so people can make it their own, right? I'm not saying I'm this guy that, you know, knows exactly what we need to do and trust me, and let's go. Because then what I do is I take away their, um, the joy of the responsibility of owning a vision. Because now they, they trust me. If I screw up on the vision, it's my fault, not their fault. There's no ownership there. And so this is very, um, I mean, the, 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 thing, the idea of this Facebook Live is for us to have these conversations right. and have right. this dialogue. We're, we're wrestling <laughs> with ideas that yeah. are, literally we talked about what is one sentence yeah, that literally. is going to spur exactly. this conversation. So it's not like we have bullet points that we want <laughs> to convey. It's literally a free flow of thought yeah. that I think it's, it's the, the interesting thing about this conversation and the last one is, is in a sense about discovering new connections uh, as we're talking. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's almost as if uh, our conviction, there's almost like a, a revelation, and that sounds overly spiritual, but almost like there's a, a, a synergy, uh, a serendipity that happens by us mm -hmm. wrestling out loud with some of Absolutely. these ideas. So that's yeah. the intent. I'm hoping you guys understand and sense that. Because what happens is a vision... <laughs> This, this might actually get me fired, right? <laughs> it will not. Okay, okay. So cone what, of grace. Remember okay, cone, cone of grace. grace. What I believe is that if you have vision clarity, you're going after fearlessness, right? Which I don't think is a good thing, right? I don't think we're called to be fearless. I think we're called to be courageous in the face right. of fear, right. right? Because if we're fearless and there's no fear within us, then we just go. Because usually clarity and uncertainty doesn't allow for faith to happen. Right? Because it's just logic. Of course we'll do that. Because look, you know, we did the plan. And this is how it's going to play out. Mm -hmm. Of course, let's do it. It's an easy yes. It's an easy yes to the logical thing. But I think vision actually calls us to faith. To believe in something that's never been believed in, never been seen, never been, you know, moving into an uncharted territory. And so for us to figure out, for us to spend a year trying to clarify that vision, right, will not get us any closer than if we actually start stepping into the fogginess of the vision and putting action instead of trying to noodle and create diagrams about how, you know, okay, so, you know, what we need to do as leaders is provide clarity. I think as leaders, we need to spur on courage to step into the unknown reality that is in front of us today. So part of that maybe is, is the idea of, you know, the book Lean Startup, which is a book that many people in the business world and the startup world have, have really embraced. It's created a movement and part of, so it, it takes on principles from lean manufacturing, which tries to eliminate waste mm -hmm. for the sake of testing, experimenting, building ideas that have a ton of input and you're just not wasting you know, when we think about stewardship, stewardship is about trying to uh, take care of what you have, make the most of what. It's not about scarcity. It's not about trying to hold, withhold, and, and not waste things. Uh, it's not about it's trying to, but it, it's really about what can we do to, in a sense, provide the most value for what we have in our hands. So it's about an exponential value. Um, so. So one of the things that he, uh, Eric Ries talks about in Lean Startup is this idea of a minimal viable product or MVP. The idea that you don't fully build out an idea, so you're not like we talked about the other day, you're not optimizing, optimizing, optimizing before you launch because you'll, you'll spend years optimizing and never launch something. But what if you had the most basic form even a foggy form of that vision, right? Where if we're talking about vision, it's a foggy, messy, um, glitchy, whatever type of word you want to use for the minimal viable product. You, you kind of launch the idea and, and, and then work it. So it's more about, and it's, I, love, I love that idea of a snowball, a rolling snowball, because you're making f forward progress but you're kind of taking the circular action that you're going through over and over. And, and uh, that's actually, they have this, this circular process that they talk about as well, testing ideas, gaining feedback, iterating, then testing, mm -hmm. learning, and building. 
Um, and so you gain velocity as well as you get better at kind of going through this process of this, you know, of, of, of development, of transformation. So what might be an example of how we might have a foggy, a foggy vision that we, in a sense, launch in a very crude and minimal, minimal viable way? Do you have an, an idea of what, well, as an example? One of my mentors and my pastor, Dave Given, says, whatever God, <laughs> you go until God says no, <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, but one of the visualization exercises I do is, is um, I imagine being in a foggy landscape and I feel a voice calling me forth, right? Not to over-spiritualize this, but I always imagine I'm in this foggy place and there's a lighthouse and there's someone calling me towards it. I don't know what the lighthouse looks like because the fog is covering it. But if I sit there and wait for the fog to roll away, I may never see it. But, what I, but the visualization I do is as I step one step closer and closer and closer, then the fogginess starts to, the fog doesn't go away, right? The fog is still there. But as you draw closer to the vision, then you start finding clarity. What I end up seeing a lot of people get stuck on is they need to see, know what the lighthouse looks like before they even take the first step. Mm -hmm. when they're but, but, but the only way to actually find the clarity on what the light, what the light looks like is you gotta walk towards it. And I think that's where, um, for me, the focus is on you know, being able to recognize the voice of the caller and recognize the callings and being able to respond to it. And so that's what I mean by step by step, right? It's faith, take a step of faith, not take a, you know, a journey of faith, right? It's always one step at a time in the scriptures they talk about, you know, mm -hmm. and even in the Chinese proverbs, you know, a, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And I think a lot of people, they get stuck on finding clarity on vision that they don't even begin. Um, I think clarity is important, that, don't get me wrong. I think as much as you can get it, that's what you need, because sometimes clarity actually does, you know, give you courage because you at least know one thing, but uh, to feel like you need the fullness, the full clarity, the, the 4K vision, you know, as, as the TV comes out, right, um, before you can start moving, I think that is, unfortunately, a lot of people die before they even take the first step. Do you think that the idea of a foggy vision appeals to a certain personality type? Oh, absolutely. Me. You know, the ENFPs, the idealists, the people that, you know, live in the la-la land. Um, definitely, I, I do agree, because some people are not wired like me. So for me, what I share is, is pretty much very personal. Mm -hmm. But what I realize is that as I communicate in this manner, there's a lot of people that resonate with what I'm saying. Because the world tells you that you have to have, you have to be able to prove everything out. And I think I shared with you recently, like my struggle and my faith and my struggle actually in my own life, the, you know, one of the transformative moments was when I actually decided to fully embrace the mystery of God. Then I felt truly free. Because I wasn't in, in the, my faith journey wasn't about trying to figure it out and fully understand but to swim in the mystery of who he is and discover his goodness, the depth of his love, versus trying to figure out how it all works. Mm -hmm. Like I'd rather just swim and enjoy the ride than try to figure out exactly why God does something and why God doesn't do something. Uh, and that's just the way that I learned to find freedom uh, in my own life to really just say, God, I don't need to know everything, but all I need to know is that you're real and you're good, and that's enough for my life. So you and I sh share similar faith, you know, we're people of faith. That may not be everybody that is watching this. They, they may not necessarily have, you know, religious, mm -hmm. you know, uh, principles by which they live. They may, but, you know, if we're to even take it out of the Christian life context or even the context of ministry, does it, this also have applications in, say, the entrepreneurial world? I mean, we kind of did talk about MVP as an idea. Um, what, what are some applications that people in the marketplace or in, in, in creative circles might do to embrace this idea of even a foggy vision? Because you work a lot with creatives. Yeah. You work a lot with artists. I mean, that's, that's, that's your jam, right? Yep. That's your community. Uh, you, you've, uh, it, all your work in downtown Santa Ana and even at New mm -hmm. Song uh, Church are really with, in a sense, this uh, community of, of cultural misfits, if you will. Yeah. 
they, they don't think the way everyone else does. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I don't even know if I had a question there. <laughs> it was more like you're setting me up <laughs> to kind of share, you know, um, there's a lot of roadblocks. Uh, let me just talk in the, in the creative world, right, uh, with, with artists that I've been working with. And a lot of them are what they call starving artists, right? They're trying to make a living doing what they love. And what ends up happening is, is they believe that their life goal is to create these expressions of art to the world. And so it tends to be a personal brand with this kind of like, this is what I, how I see the world, this is how I think about the world, you know, love it or hate it, this is who I am, blah. And they just create all these expressions and they put it out there. And the whole thing is all about self-expression. Right. And what I try to do is try to help them move into, actually, instead of going about, in a sense of creating self-expression, but creating value with the art. So moving artists into artisan, right? Uh, meaning, you know, don't be someone that's about self-expression, be someone that's a craftsman and become a master of the craft. And then after you become the master of the craft, then people will want to hear your story, and that's when you can build your personal brand. But do the work is, is pretty much what I'm trying to get them to, to move towards, which really is simply, I gotta get them started, keep them moving, and help them finish well. And, and what I've learned is that starting is the hardest part for most people, because they want to know their destiny, they want to know the purpose of why they exist. Literally, the question I ask is, you want to know who you are and why you exist, don't you? And they're like, how'd you know? I'm like, because everybody wants to know that. But then you're going to sit there and read books and you know, watch videos and, and just try to get someone to give you the answer instead of doing the hard work of self-discovery. They want to be, they want to take on the, the stickers that everyone else is creating and putting it on themselves. So their identity is shaped from circumstance and environment versus coming from within. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, a lot of people feel like there's nothing within, that's why they don't want to go there, right? And so instead they put on clothes and they put on hairstyles and tattoos and all, all kinds of stuff um, to show the world this is who I am uh, based upon the things that they're seeing in the, in the culture. But I feel like you know, doing the hard work of digging deep inside to discover not even discover, but work through who you are going to be. Right. So it's not like I know a lot of young people I work with say, "This is who I am." You know, like I, you know, sometimes you know they'll say like, "Be you, boo." You know that kind of language, right? Yeah. And I'd be yeah. like, "There's nothing wrong with being yourself and, and and being true to yourself, but that's in this moment." But but I think the purpose in life, in my context, or actually. My own idea of purpose in life is growth. And so I'm trying to move people to get started on becoming the person they were always meant to be. Yeah. Instead of just saying, this is how I roll, this is who I am, take it or leave it, you know? And then all of a sudden, you know, they feel alone because they're not transforming themselves. Right. Um, is, it, is it part of this idea where, you know, if I'm, if I'm trying to, in a sense, process what you're saying, uh, this idea of one, on one hand saying, I need to prepare in order to start the journey mm -hmm. versus I need to start the journey so I can prepare for life throughout the journey. So in a sense, mm -hmm. the journey prepares you. Mm -hmm. There's no way, you know, it's like, you know, saying parenthood, you know, they say, well, I don't know if I'm ready to have kids. Well, we're never ready to have Absolutely. kids. We just have kids. And then by the virtue of being a parent, we become the parent we should be. Mm -hmm. But it's about a growth mindset as opposed to mm -hmm. saying, well, I need to figure this out for the first 10 years of my marriage so that I'm, I'm a good parent. I think that the act of parenting makes you a good parent. Mm -hmm. You can't ever be a good parent without just, you know, oh. be, I'm speaking in circles here. But, um, you know, I, well, I, let me let me just kind of redefine something. I don't believe that we have one journey. We have one legacy, hmm. right? So I just want to, you know, kind of like what we yeah, talked we about talked yesterday. we talked about the yesterday, so, so share that with So me. it's not a, like, life is broken. Really, it's, life is not a journey. <laughs> you 
you know, life is a series of transformative journeys mm -hmm. that allow us to have these journeys and journeys and journeys that help us become fully who we are and fully allow us to create the value that we'll leave behind. Because our life is not about what we accomplish, but what we leave behind, right? The legacy. And so I would think that, um, you know, our pursuit is, is in thinking more of multi-generational versus our lifetime. So one of the exercises that I also do with our friends is I say like, what, you know, don't confine, whether you believe in the afterlife or not, if you confine your life with it, like if you try to feel like the work that you're going to do is contained in your own lifetime, then you're thinking too small. So what are you doing today that will affect generations to come? then you have a different strategy. Because now you're not chasing after the short fix or the short spike on your Instagram followers or, or likes, but you're actually thinking through how the things that you're creating will live on from generation to generation to generation. Because what you're doing is a legacy you're leaving behind is for someone else to take it and make it better. And so... Well, one, so what you described yesterday, so, you know, as we talk, and as we prepare for, like we were basically yesterday, we were uh, doing a series of design thinking exercises to effectively design the next talk that I'm going to be giving. And as part of that conversation, putting post-it notes up on the uh, on the wall, uh, we, we were talking about this idea of moments. That the idea of experience, if you know Brian Salas, he has this quote that he said. It says that an experience is an emotional response to a moment. So we started talking about what can we do to create moments that are memorable and transformative. And so one of the things you shared with me in kind of the, the thinking that mm -hmm. you, you had is the idea that a ser there's moments mm -hmm. and then a series of moments is mm -hmm. a season, mm -hmm. right? And then a series of seasons is a journey and like you said we have multiple journeys in our lives so a series of journeys is our legacy or in the word that you use was this is the generation that i'm a part of but that legacy will impact other generations therefore other legacies so it was it was really interesting that that came into the conversation even when we were thinking about our talk uh, mm -hmm. yesterday um, love to get your guys' thoughts. I think this is probably good for today. Um, we'd love to get your thoughts about whether you have any thoughts or comments. I'm not seeing them all uh, come up if they are coming in, but would love for you to go ahead and like it if you like. You can comment below to give even ideas for other questions or other topics that we may talk about in the future. But if you did find some value in what we rambled on about, um, Go ahead and share it as well. We'd love, oh, we got one. All right, thank you. Uh, <laughs> we'd love to for you to share it as well. It's a lot of fun for us, so we'd love to continue it and yeah. see what you guys think. All right, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.